All right. Well, we're going to uh, shift a little bit right now. We've got old friend RJ Abatia with us. He covers USC football for uscfootball.com. It's a 24-7 affiliate. Thanks, thanks first of all, RJ, for taking some time with us today, especially since, obviously, uh, I'm sure you've been pretty busy in the last week or so. <laughs> It's been eventful, you know. Uh, when I uh, when I when I hopped onto the USC beat, um, it comes with expectations, as you know from the outside. And I right. have to say, over the past year, uh, they they've lived up to the expectations. Never a dull moment, and I think maybe the most exciting moment of them all happened last week. Well, yeah, obviously, you know, we're going to start with that, and you know, I think for the you know the majority of us are looking at this from the outside in obviously you know it, it's like we're not affiliated with USC and UCLA and here they go the seismic move you know sends literal shockwaves across the college football landscape but but you know you're there ground zero in Los Angeles so just what do you think of it's been about a week now what do you, what do you think of of what happened first of all well i think there's a, there's a couple different lenses to look at. I think the longer term, bigger picture lens kind of makes this not a huge shock. Um, if you look at the big picture about where college football is very clearly headed, it seems like at this point, I think it's, you know, you're looking at kind of an NFL model with an NFC and an AFC, whether that ends up being two 16 team conferences or two 20 team conferences or whatever the number ends up being. You're basically talking about 30 to 40 teams who are competing for the championship, as it were, and the rest of college football kind of left to be normal, traditional college football, I suppose. Right. Um, so in, in that regard, I think this was coming in some form at some point. I don't think anybody, even even the, you know, the, the people who follow USC, I think a lot of people inside USC, you know, except for a very, very close knit of movers close group of movers and shakers probably didn't think last week it was happening. <laughs> Certainly the PAC 12 to the extent that they've reacted clearly suggests this was not something that they had been given any heads up or warning about. Um, yeah. So long-term it's a little bit less of a surprise. If you look in the short term at just how far behind the PAC 12 has fallen in terms of revenue, mm -hmm. prestige on the field results, I mean, you know, you can have a chicken or egg debate about those factors, but they're all factors and they're all realities. And when you right. look at the way the Pac-12 has has trended in the last decade, um, I think you had Stanford winning the 2016 Rose Bowl from the 2015 season. They finished, I think, ranked fourth or fifth. It was a top five finish. And since then, there haven't been a lot of top five national finishes from the Pac-12, let alone playoff appearances. And, and so when you look at it that way, you know, the momentum is it's negative momentum, but it's still momentum, right? That, you know, the momentum had been building for a situation like this, because really for a school like USC, who takes football as seriously as they do and wants to be up there in that top level with Alabama and Ohio state and Clemson and Notre Dame. Um, you have to have a part of where the game's going. You have to have a footprint. You have to have a toehold and there's no time like the present. What about, what about fans? What, you know, what do you think they, what do they think about this whole move? Because obviously it's going to be a big change for them going from, geographically playing games obviously close to home and you're you're in the pack 12 now you know what was the pack eight and the you know the pack 10 they'd been there pretty much forever what, what do they think about a move like this you know i think they're still so awash in the lincoln riley honeymoon phase <laughs> that i i just don't think anything's gonna take the the steam out of their their sails um the wind out of their sails i should say um at this point, you know, there's there's no games, there are no losses, so there's nothing to really be upset about. You might as well dream big, right? Um, but I, but I do think, you know, look, it's part of what they wanted when they got Lincoln Riley. The whole point is for USC to be back in the conversation with the elite teams, and going to the Big Ten um, very clearly indicates you're committed to doing that. 
right? And I, I don't think, you know, obviously you're the guy to talk to about where Notre Dame stands on that or where they're headed and, and all that. But I, I would sure. not be surprised to see Notre Dame in the Big Ten at some point. And I wouldn't be surprised to see, like we discussed at the top, the teams who are truly elite, truly interested, truly committed financially in terms of the fan base and all of that to going after the national championship and playing college football at the highest level, you're going to have one of two choices, I think, at the end of the day. So, I mean, again, for the fans, I think there is a little bit of nostalgia and sadness. There's going to be a little bit of a, I don't want to get too dramatic, but, you know, there's some fan <laughs> grieving, I think, over the next couple of years as you kind of say to yourself, wow, is this is this the last time we watched Stanford and USC play as Pac-12 opponents or the last right. time maybe we see them play? You know, if you're an Oregon State or a Washington State, is US this USC's final visit? Is this our final visit to the Coliseum? Same for the Rose Bowl with UCLA, you know? So I, it's not, I don't want to dismiss that. I just think that not just money wins out, but I think winning wins out. I mean, I think that this is a winning move. You can't argue it any other way at this point. Pac-12 argue differently, I guess, at this point. What's, you know, the other side of this? I think this is great for both USC and UCLA. Do you think the Pac-12 can survive this? Because, you know, I know there are, you know, some different layers to this, both both media wise and lose the Los Angeles market, the impact of that. Do you, do you, what do you think about the viability of the conference going forward? Well, um, the short answer as is, is no, they, they can't. And I think they clearly know they can't, you know, there have been releases very, very brief and to the point releases over the past two days or the past week from the PAC 12 office. Um, Number one is all doors are open. All avenues are open in terms of reaching out, in terms of taking calls from maybe the Big 12 or some other schools or independent schools. Um, so they are, whether they wanted to or not, they are open for business in terms of adding teams or becoming part of something bigger. Because as they are, as it's constructed right now, there's no future for the Pac-12, Pac-10, Pac-8, Pac-7, whatever you want, whatever it ends up being. Right. Um, there just isn't. You can't, you can't hand away the crown jewels of your conference from a financial, a prestige, relatability, acknowledgeability, you know, identifying. You just can't do that. There's no replacing those two schools at all. So, you know, I think first off, you have to see who else is going to jump ship. The picture changes dramatically if you're talking about Stanford moving to the Big Ten as well. Some combination of Oregon and or Washington moving to the Big Ten as well. Suddenly now you're dealing with a situation where you're not so much going to be bringing teams in as you are going to be looking to be a part of something else. You know, And there are certainly models um, and, and speculation in terms of some of the newer schools, you know, if you talk about Utah, Colorado, Arizona, Arizona State, who I believe are the schools who went, took it from Pac-8 to Pac-10, if I'm not mistaken, um, going to the Big 12. And I think versions of that make a lot of sense. Versions of a Pac-12, Big 12 combination make a lot of sense. I don't know in the long, long term if that's just rearranging deck chairs. Um but I do know that the Pac-12 cannot survive past the two seasons that it has with USC and UCLA still in the fold as is. It seems to me, you know, because the the Pac-12 is already, I think they were in a, maybe a little bit better shape than the Big 12, you know, before all this happened. But, you know, the Big 12 has obviously been scrambling and losing Texas and Oklahoma last year it was not quite as bad as this is for the Pac-12 it, it seems to me though if both conferences want to survive that a merger is probably the best bet for both of them what, what do you think about that aspect I I think that's probably the smartest thing to do because to be honest with you what are you proving by trying to go it alone 
right or go independently at this point there's no you're not you're not getting anything for for standing strong and taking in school a b and c who isn't going to move the needle for you in the way that it needs to be moved you know if you look at the big 12 um that's a conference that loves its football that supports its football and you could also argue the same about the basketball yeah you know obviously it's not as significant at the end of the day when we're talking about the bottom line in terms of football but my goodness if you talk about some of those pac-12 schools joining what is already if not the best one of the top two or three best basketball conferences in the country you have a product you have something sellable right you've got you've got good football programs in the big 12 you got the support like we just talked about you've also got basketball to bring to the table you know uh, you know and, and certainly i think like you know arizona joining that conference that's appealing that yeah. that's the basketball equivalent of usc joining the big 10 in terms of football right in in a lot of ways so i think there's a path towards number one survival and maybe even flourishing to the extent that they can flourish but you know it all remains to be seen and also you know you have to you have to check your flank at any moment right because <laughs> at any moment who you think you are might not be who you are that's right at that point which is you know a lesson they learned last week absolutely do, do you think and i've heard this kind of pose do you think lincoln riley when he took this job do you think he had any idea that this could be coming that's a great question um, because, you know, there was a lot of noise when the Oklahoma, Texas thing happened and that, you know, did Lincoln Riley know about that? Did he want to be part of that? Did he not want to be part of that? And that's why on some level he's coaching at USC. Uh, Mike Bone, the athletic director and Brandon Sosna, who's a, the outgoing um, chief of staff for USC, he's taking a job with the Detroit Lions. Um, those guys are pretty forward thinkers in terms of where they want USC football to be. Um, in that magical 72 hour window where <laughs> Oklahoma lost the big 12 championship game and USC circled the wagons, went out there, opened up, you know, backed up the Brinks truck, did what they had to do. Did conference realignment come up at some point in that 72 hours? I mean, maybe, but I kind of, I kind of doubt it. I think those conversations on some level happened. Um, but I also think, you know, again, this is part of a bigger sequence for, for USC. Yeah. You know, and, and to be honest with you, if you're Lincoln Riley and you're, you're here to try to win a national championship, you've done yourself a service by upgrading the quality of competition. I think there's no other way to say it now the logistics of it all you know fans are having a lot of fun talking about usc playing a 9 a.m pacific game in some <laughs> blizzard in iowa city or east right. Lansing or wherever um but i i tend to think that if we're just talking football and just winning football games and the balance of everything i think they've done themselves right they, they kind of did what they had to do and I think, you know, at whatever point Lincoln Riley was looped in, I think he was probably all for it. The the Pac-12 commissioner, George Klayevkov, he voted against the 12-team college football playoff format when, when he, you know, the last time it came to a vote, you know, because it didn't guarantee the Pac-12 a spot in the playoffs. Maybe this is an obvious question. Do you think if he had a mulligan, you know, like if, if you told him right now, George, you can still vote for it. Do you think that, that that he would go back and do it today? I mean, I think the safest thing to say is he would clearly revisit it. <laughs> um, he would happily revisit it. But I also think, you know, George Klebkoff is kind of the guy showing up at the end of the dance with a with a huge cleanup job. Yeah. Um for a mess he didn't make. Yeah. You know, again, this this mess, if we're going to talk about it in those terms, has been years in the making. You know, when the Pac-12, when the Pac-12 made its media deal for the brief moment, because this is how money works, it was the most lucrative deal that any conference had signed in terms of the total dollar amount. 
And I also think it's you do have to be honest and say it's not like everyone said, well, this was a completely failed deal. They're going to get left completely in the dust. But I think when you look at the inability to get the network onto direct TV, to get the network out to people across the country, um, when you talk about the subsequent deals, the lack of flexibility that the Pac-12 had in the wake of new deals from the Big Ten, from the ACC, from the SEC, and you just accumulate all of that, you know, it's just tough to overcome. It's just a perfect storm that you just can't compete with. You know, when you're, you're talking about early projections for USC and UCLA, when you're talking about a hundred million extra dollars annually coming in, right? There's no negotiating with that. If you're, if you're competing with schools who annually are bringing in that sort of revenue every year and they're building that, that lead builds, it's not just, well, we made a hundred more than you this year. Well, two years later, you've got 200 more than they do, you know, and you know, the race of facilities, resources, and what you have to devote to being a top tier football team as Notre Dame has developed and done over the past decade. Like it's not a, it's not a small check. It's a big check. Right. You know, and if you're not crossing off that box, if you're not taking care of yourself in that way, you're not seriously competing. Yeah, that's amazing when you look at Pac-12, Big Ten, ACC. They all have relatively new conference commissioners who are basically, you know, like Jim Phillips in the ACC, the, the TV contract he inherited, not very good. Whereas Kevin Warren gets great timing because his contract is coming up first. He's going to get bucket loads of money for it. And, in you know, the, the, the result is what we're getting. Right now, you know, the, the, the windfall of, of all that money that he's going to get is is really driving all of this, obviously. Yeah, I mean, I do think that's a good point. I mean, you have to, you know, fans want a clear narrative storyline, right? They want, well, Larry Scott was terrible. That's why the Pac-12 died. The Big Ten's on the rise, so Kevin Warren must be a genius. And Larry Scott was not great. Don't Do not get me wrong. Right. But it's rarely that simple. Yeah. You know, and timing has a lot to do with it. But also, you know, you also have to, again, you could apply the same analysis to the Big Ten. The Big Ten set itself up with strong TV partnerships. Yeah. You know, they made significant infusions of cash, you know, not just the big name Big Ten programs. If you look at, I mean, Northwestern's football facility. You right. Know, it's spectacular. There's yeah. been an investment. You know, that's not that's not Michigan investing in their football f- stadium. You know, that's not Michigan State. You know, it's not Penn State investing. That's right. you know, that's just, hey, we're in the Big Ten and this is now par for the course. This is what you have to do. Yeah. They got ahead of people on expansion. Yep. You know, they brought records in Maryland in. You can argue. Oh, were those the schools they should bring or have they, you know, have they really moved the needle for the big 10? Well, they've created those markets, you know, Rutgers gets to play Michigan every X amount of years. They play Michigan state, they play Penn state, they play Ohio state, same thing for Maryland, you know? And so I I think when you, when you look at it like that, the big 10, yes, the timing of it is fortuitous. They are benefiting from timing but I also think they set themselves up to benefit. Before we, uh, you know, let you go here in a few minutes, let's, let's talk a little bit of actual USC football. (laughs) Oh my God. Since we, I know it's right. It's like, who, who would have thought? Let's break the string. That's right. You know, Notre Dame. want to hear about football? Really? (laughs) I mean, what, we're about a month away from training camp starting, which is kind of amazing, you know, considering everything else going on. Right now, you got to see Lincoln Riley out there in the spring, his first spring yeah. in in you know at at USC. What's you know we know about all the transfers and Caleb Williams and Jordan Addison afterwards, you know all that different stuff. What's maybe the biggest impact you actually saw from what you were able to see, you know, on field from Lincoln Riley during spring practice? 
from what we saw on the field and from what we've heard talking to players, I would, I would say both on and off the record, to be quite honest with you and talking to people kind of inside the building who have bridged the gap and who have, who are still there and kind of have seen both things. Um, it's, it's, it's just a different place now. It's, it's, it's it, just watching Lincoln Riley coach. It's a different situation. Like this is, this is a properly coached football team now. They're being developed. They're being pushed. Um, I think the strength and conditioning, and I, I you know, it's. I, I think it's fair to fold your hands and kind of wait till the fall, but because every program loves to tout its strength and conditioning, every program has the most amazing strength and conditioning coach you've ever met. Right. You know, everyone, everyone sells that to a certain extent, and so we do have to kind of wait, but. The impact that Benny Wiley has made, you can just visually see it on a number of the players. You could see it during spring, and it's happening now as we speak this summer. I mean, this is this is a football team and a football program that is that is under very elite, very strong leadership right now. And you know, the question I always get asked is, you know, what what's realistic? What's how good are they going to be? You know, and of course, again. I've used this metaphor a hundred times, but you know, <laughs> USC football fans, you know, they are like kids on Christmas morning rushing down to open their presents and they want to <laughs> open up a national championship present. They want a Pac-12 championship. They want, you know, 11 wins is, is okay, but we want 12, we want 13. That's, you know, and in year one, I think that's asking a lot. Um, but I will say they are going to unquestionably be a better football team. Um, I don't think there's any way, shape or form about it, how far they can go in year one. They have a favorable schedule. Right. Um, That's the thing really that stands out to me, you know, like you want, you know, you can talk, well, are they really going to be that good? It seems like you, you know, it kind of comes down to Utah and Notre Dame to me, don't you think? Well, yeah, but I think, you know, that when, when you look at a schedule, the, the thing that everyone kind of doesn't do is you have to look at the cumulative impact of the schedule. In other words, you know, last year, for example, I think I'm forgetting, I think I'm getting the sequence. I think it was, they played Utah, had the bye week and then played Notre Dame. So both those games were losses, obviously, but you know, you play Utah and Notre Dame two, uh, two times in three weeks. You're not in a great place physically. That's true. Yeah. You know, and so to look at the schedule individual and say one by one, well, they, they have more talent than that team. They should probably win. They have more talent than that team. Well, yeah, but you don't know what game one is going to do to your game two. Game two is going to do your game three. And sure. the other thing is, is that it's not that these elite elite programs don't always beat elite teams. What they do is they beat the teams they're supposed to beat. And what USC has not done you know, people talk about, well, they can't beat this team. They can't beat Notre Dame. They can't beat Utah. But it's the games that they give away right? that have put them, you know, below the tier that they want to be at. And the, the culture that you have to have where you don't have a slip up, you know, for nine, eight, nine, ten weeks, it's easy to get up for Notre Dame. It's easy to get up for UCLA. It's easy to get up for Utah on a certain extent, right? But Oregon State's coming to the Coliseum. Why are we excited about that? Why are we going to be up for that? And sure. it showed on the field. I mean, Oregon State came into the Coliseum and ran them over. You know, I mean, that was just the reality. And so, you know, I think the culture and the mindset and all those things are headed in the right direction. Whether they're going to be there on time for September 3rd and run them through their first year with Lincoln Riley. With, with, again, an unprecedented roster, that's the other part of this, right, is that this isn't the same guys who have been there for three or four years. This is a team that is a new team. They don't have – they've never played a game together. This team has never played agents, a game together. Yeah, yeah. So who knows how many stumbling blocks they're going to be. I think you'd if you're looking at it as an opponent, you'd rather get USC in the first month than the last month. Um. But it's all hypothetical at this point. But I, I think they're going to be much, much better. They're just going to be a better coached football team. Um, 
and that's going to manifest itself in more wins. I don't think they're quite ready to step up amongst the elite elite, but um, it should be, it, it's going in the right direction and they should be a lot of fun to watch this year. That I'm very sure of. I mean, yeah, I mean, there's skilled talent everywhere, especially with all those transfers. Is, is it fair? Oh, and I'll, this will be the last thing I'll ask. Is it, is it fair that probably going into the, into training camp, at least two of their, you know, top three questions, if not the first two are just what's going to happen with the two lines, both offensive and defensive. So um, the offensive line uh, very quietly because, you know, no one pays attention to anything good that happens in a losing season. But the offensive line stepped forward last year. They stepped forward in a lot of different categories. I wouldn't call them elite at the end of last year, but they were good. They were a good yeah. offensive line. And one of the biggest breaks that Lincoln Riley got, I think, is that despite all the transfer portal fluctuation, the line is basically intact. And they are experienced guys. You talk about Brett Nealon, he's going to be a, I think this might be his sixth year on campus, maybe fifth, but senior, you've got senior guys who are good. You know, Andrew Voorhees, they've got four out of the five spots pretty well identified on the offensive line. So I don't know if they're ready to take that next step under a first year offensive line coach, but they're going to be good. Now the defensive line is yes. You know, their best player is Tuli Tui Pulotu. We know him. We're, he's a pretty known commodity. He's an all-conference level guy. After that, there's a lot of question marks. I think that, you know, for going back to your to your initial query, I think if I'm if I'm looking at the two areas where you're holding your breath the most, I think one is defensive line, and two is at cornerback, where they have to replace both their starters, um, and 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 the fact that the favorites right now are transfers um is dicey i mean you know they got makai blackman from colorado who got hurt in spring so he didn't even get a full spring camp experience but i think most people have him at least penciled in if not penned in as a starter and then they picked up jacoby covington from washington after spring practice and you still got some younger guys in house but none of them did anything in the spring to make you think they were going to run away with a starting job. So I think big picture, the question mark is with every Lincoln Riley team, will they defend enough to win? Sure. I don't think anyone, th there's, there's no one questioning at this point, if they're going to score, they're going to score points. There's no question about it. There's just too much there. Yeah. Um, not to, and he's a, he's Lincoln Riley. Like that's the other thing is it's not like we're just going to roll the talent out. These guys are going to be <laughs> ready and well that's prepared. True. Defensively, that's the question. How good can they be? And if you're answering that question, you're looking at the defensive line and cornerback positions to start with. Yeah. And as you said, I mean, it won't be until Thanksgiving weekend in the Coliseum when Notre Dame and USC play. So everything we, we could be looking at, a probably will be looking at a completely different set of questions by then. I, I'm sure. The only thing that we can count on is we have no idea. Yeah, that's right. That's exactly right. Just like we had no idea this was coming last week. <laughs> RJ, it's always great catching up to you. Appreciate your time, and, and hopefully we will catch up to you uh, later on going into that Thanksgiving weekend and, and kind of preview what's what's going on with both of these teams at that point. Great to talk to you, buddy. Have a great summer, Sean. Thanks for having me. You too. RJ Abatia from uscfootball.com.